good? Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I'm Gina Vild. I'm the Associate Dean for Communications and External Relations at Harvard Medical School. So for all of you who are here in the amphitheater and to all who are watching from around the world through live streaming, I welcome you. Our last HMS talk was viewed by people in 36 countries. So from, where, from wherever you're watching, thank you. When you think about medicine, what comes to mind? For many, the first thought is about clinical care and about perhaps being in a doctor's office. But what people may not immediately consider is that the very foundation of what happens in your doctor's office really is about bench science. That is, basic research that advances the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease. It's basic science that's the source for new techniques, tools, and cure cures across multiple disciplines for diseases ranging from cancer to arthritis to heart disease. And although we call it basic, nothing could be farther from the truth because it's basic science that is at the core of all biomedical discovery. The French novelist Marcel Proust once said, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscape, but in having new eyes. With this in mind, I'm pleased to introduce three highly esteemed members of our faculty who are looking with new eyes at some of the most intractable issues in biomedicine. Their innovative research and analysis is providing the foundation for novel treatments and the ability to gauge the effectiveness of new tools. Pam Silver is a professor of systems biology and a founding member of the Wies Institute. She was one of the founding members of the Department of Systems Biology and was the first director of the Harvard University Graduate Program in Systems Biology. Her current research aims to enhance the understanding of natural biologic design and to develop tools and concepts for designing cells, tissues, and organisms. Bapu Jenna is an associate professor of healthcare policy at HMS and a physician in the Department of Medicine at Massachusetts General Hospital. As an economist and physician, Dr. Jenna's research has established an uncommon expertise in the application of economic theory to clinical practice. His work involves the economics of healthcare productivity and the economics of medical innovation. But first you'll hear from Peter Sorger, head of the Harvard Program in Therapeutic Science, or as we call it, HITS. He is a professor of systems biology, and as a head of HITS, Dr. Sorger leads a university-wide effort to advance basic and translational science. The science used to develop new medicines, identify patients most likely to benefit from scientific therapies, and evaluate new drugs through precision clinical tools. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sorger. 
effectively guide therapy and not just to do diagnosis is really only within the last 20 years. And the concept illustrated very simply uh, in this diagram is that you have a mutant protein in a cell, a, an oncogenic driver here in yellow, and that that sends an abnormal growth signal here indicated by the red lightning. And the consequence of that is that there is abnormal proliferation or excessive survival of cells beyond what normally would be allowed by the, by the body, and that that is then oncogenic. And the silver bullet is then the drug that comes along, binds specifically into that oncogenic program, and then renormalizes the growth uh, pathway. And you can see below here a series of drugs, five, six, eight of them have actually been put into clinical development through no small part of the efforts of the cancer centers here at Harvard uh, and at, uh, at, at, at the Derrick Harvard Cancer Center. treat them at a saturating concentration of a drug that will kill them, 
And what is left then shall die in different times, the movie we did not see, and then 20% of the cells will survive, even if you go to the maximum dose. And if you take those cells, and you put them in the dish again, and you go home for the weekend, and you come back, and you repeat the experiment, you will observe exactly the same phenomenon. That is that they will fractionally die, and you will once again recover a population of cells which is able to reset back to the initial condition. And the difference then here is clearly not a genetic difference, but instead an epigenetic one. And what we are now pursuing is the idea that this inability to kill all of the cells in the population due to natural fluctuation in the way cells operate is one of the bases of residual disease, a disease that is not initially treated by the precision medicine. Now there's a much more to this story you can imagine. So here's a picture that actually has recently come out of work in the lab, not published, and in fact only just a couple of uh, weeks old, in which we've taken a human melanoma and we stained it now with a series of antibodies against different antigens. And we can now take these images and do up to 30, 40 different colors, each of them looking at a different feature of the underlying cancer. And what we've come to appreciate is important in these circumstances is that we both consider the uh, differences between one cell to the next that I showed you in the simple dish experiment, but in addition that we look at the geography of these cells. And um, this, in fact, is a high-dimensional image. I've given you a couple of slices to give you a sense. The tumor itself lies in here. It's surrounded by normal stromal tissue. You can see the tumor is, in fact, influencing the arrangement of that tissue and, in fact, the, its activation state here. And then eventually there is inflotation from a series of immune cells and those things in toto make up the natural environmental milieu. And it's the understanding of these sorts of phenomena that now is responsible for driving the next wave of therapeutic hypotheses. So I want to end with one final thought, and that relates to the question of how one will deal with the underlying complexity to which I've alluded. So we no longer can think about precision medicine purely in terms of an oncogenic driver and a magic bullet. We have to consider much more about how the cell will respond to that natural perturbation and how it will respond to the drug and how it will fight back and where it lives in its geography. And it's worth pointing out that when you have complexity of this type in all other areas of natural discovery or in engineering, you turn to simulation science. And I showed you an example here. On the left, we have the pretty picture of an airplane. I think Boeing uses these to go out and sell airplanes. And on the right, you see from the national labs a simulation of an aircraft flying through a tunnel. This is a transonic simulation. And it's really the ability to move between the real world and the world of computer simulation that allows us to build aircraft that function as reliably and that do so so economically. In contrast, most of you are aware, when we get to drug discovery, we have on the order of an 80 or 90% failure rate. And at least part of the reason is the complexity to which I've alluded is relatively poorly managed. And much of what our group is now doing, in addition to trying to get at these adaptive responses I've told you about, is to begin to cast them in computational form. So going from the pretty picture on the left to the computer representation of the underlying biology on the right. And what is that going to look like in the future. Many of you have, have seen these kind of representations of underlying complexity. I've given you one example on the left. This is all of the genes that function around the RAS oncoprotein, one of the most famous RAS genes. I think those of you who look at this quickly comes to mind is the concept of a hairball, namely something not particularly useful. But I would draw your attention to the analogy on the right. These are all the roads in Massachusetts. Um, it does not show all the potholes in Massachusetts. That's an even more complicated picture. These are all of the roads in Massachusetts, and it's not a particularly useful representation. And so the trick here is to do something like what Google Maps is able to do. That is to be able to zoom into a particular area of interest and then do something, execute something against that representation. So here's a zoomed-in representation of Harvard Medical School. Here's how you would have arrived at today's meeting if you come from the other side of the quad. So you have a local picture, and you're able to ask yourself, how can I move within that landscape to get from one place to the other? And so the computational challenge for those of uh, us in the lab working it on the left, here's a little bit around RAS. 
is to actually turn this into a set of underlying mathematical concepts. And here you can see sort of the representation of this, never easy to give people a sense of exactly how this looks in the computer. But this is the elementary biochemistry at a very narrow level. And now for us to move back and forth between the local environment and the larger environment. And I want one to imagine that this is exactly the kind of semantic zoom that you can do on a Google map. We can hold in our minds a pretty good idea of how to get from one side of Boston to the other. What we can't accurately do is predict how to get there most efficiently on any given day. And that really is the purpose of this kind of executable model. So I want to close there and leave you with the idea that we are now entering a phase in the development of therapeutics in cancer, which I've talked about today, but eventually much more broadly, in which we concern ourselves not only with the original pre-treatment state, that sort of search for the magic bullet, the particular gene which itself is a drug target, but instead we also have to now ask ourselves, how do cells adapt that, to that initial therapeutic treatment? To what extent are they able to fight back, overcome, and reestablish the disease potential? And that is not going to be as simple a story as the one we have used over the last 20 or 30 years to develop the first generation of precision medicines. And it's precisely for that reason that we're going to bring a new tool, one that we've little exploited up to now. And that really is the, the, uh, the tool given to us by artificial intelligence and modern computer science. So when you go to your laboratories, or in the future when you go to your physician, I think you're going to see a much stronger basis for evidentiary basis in simulation models and in the kind of sort of computer representation of reality that I've analogized with a Google map. Thank you very much. So our next speaker is uh, Pam Silver, and uh, I'm going to let her introduce herself. Well, should I be using the handheld or? Okay. Thank you, Peter, for that great introduction. <laughs> Can you hear me? I don't know what the situation is with the mic. Should they be hearing me? What are you worried about with the mic? Oh, we uh, never called. It wasn't, hmm? it wasn't picking up. Okay, should I just start talking and see? Okay, hi. Um, let's see, I'm going to go back to my talk. Okay, good afternoon. Um, let me begin with the gut. So the, our guts are the major conduit, one of the major conduits between the outside world and our bodies. And it is the bacteria that live in the gut that are responsible for breaking down food, delivering nutrients to your body, for your overall health, and even our mood and behavior. Um, most of you are highly aware of the microbiome and the studies being shown every day, I think, in the paper. There's a new one that shows that by transplanting your microbiome, you can change something about yourself. One of the most amazing is that, and this will make you take pause, um, jet-lagged uh, people tend to be more obese, and they can mimic that in a rat. Um, the rat, uh, how you make a rat jet-lagged, just keep it in the light all the time, but it will get fatter. But if you take, and moreover, if you take a normal rat and transplant human jet lag bacteria into it, that rat will become obese. So think about that. <laughs> a little scary. Now, for the purposes of what I'm going to say, though, I'm, I emphasize that the, the bacteria in your gut are both responsible for your health, your overall well being, um, your behavior. They are also the site of major infection and the target of antibiotics, and also the site of chronic, the gut is the site of chronic diseases, um, inflammatory diseases that affect many people, and are, they are chronically in pain with these diseases. Now, the bacteria that live in your gut, and this is some, based on 50 some odd years of molecular biology, we understand this, this biology really well of bacteria. We understand how they sense things. And because we understand it so well, we can reprogram them to sense many things in their environment and to take action. So we can treat the bacteria like a little microprocessor. 
that can respond to its environment and do something useful, record that there's been a bad event, even perhaps deliver a therapeutic. So in the context of this talk, when I talk about living therapeutics, I'm talking about engineering bacteria in your gut that can both diagnose and treat disease. So imagine, um, and let me qualify this, that so far no humans, to my knowledge, have been used in this work. But imagine a time when you could design a bacteria that you would take as a pill and depending on whether your gut was in a diseased state or not, the bacteria that comes out would register that, perhaps by turning color or emitting a signal that you could then screen for um, easily. So this is one of the visions. And I want to also emphasize one thing about the gut and other parts of the body it's ex we have to explore in dark places. We don't, we don't have read readily available ways to see what's going on. So again, I draw the analogy to having a computer that can register an event and then tell you when that event happened and do something about it. So how do we do that? So I've drawn the analogy to flipping a light switch. And we can build what's called a genetic circuit, and we understand these well enough to be able to design them in a predictable way, that when the cell senses a particular signal, it flips a switch, much like you would flip a light switch, and then stays on for the rest of its time, for example, in the gut. So in this way, by flipping the switch, the cell can tell you that it saw something and remembers it. Now, here's an example of a circuit that we've built that senses inflammation. Now, most of you are saying, oh my god, I'm not, I can't even see it, more or less understand it. And the, that's part of the point, is that we want to get to a point where we can systematically engineer cells on demand, and you don't have to understand how it works, much like how many of you can explain to me how your iPhone works. Good luck with that. So I imagine the engineered cell would be like a black box and that depending on the input, it would register a certain output. And so again, it's like many kinds of measurement devices, but this is a living one. So we did that. We took that circuit, that really complicated circuit. We synthesized DNA. We put it into a natural gut bacteria, a natural gut E. coli in the mouse. We took the mouse, mice and we dosed them with our special diagnostic bacteria, and with salmonella. Salmonella, which most of you know is sort of evil, um, will induce an inflammatory response. And then we measure, we look at the bacteria by growing them on a Petri plate and whether or not they turn color. And if they turn color, that is indicative that they have been exposed to the inflammatory response from the salmonella. And this works. Not only does it work for salmonella, it can work for other kinds of inflammation that would be typical of the kinds of inflammation you might see with inflammatory bowel disease. So we can make an effective diagnostic. However, going forward, can we take this one step further? Not only can, could we, can we make a diagnostic, can we also make a therapeutic? So bacteria can produce lots of things. They can produce antibiotics. They can produce small molecules. They can produce proteins. <clears throat> they can produce molecules that will kill other bacteria. So in all those ways, not only could our bacteria sense what's going on, but then could it locally deliver something to, say, kill the salmonella in their niche, or deliver a molecule that would selectively uh, reduce the pain from your inflammation. So this is the plan, and we have begun to implement this. Now, if you're thinking about this for a moment, when I ask the typical crowd, would you find, these are engineered organisms. So they're, they're essentially GMOs. I asked a crowd recently in New York, how many of you would take such an organism, um, especially if you suffered from a chronic disease, almost everyone in the audience raised their hand. Now, maybe that's a New York crowd. I won't do the same thing here. <laughs> um, but, but this audience, I'm sure, is much more 
um, attuned to the pros and cons of gen genetically modified organisms. But in the last 10 years or so, we have now new technologies that gives us a way to start to overcome the dangers of potential dangers of use of genetically modified organisms. One of those is recombination of genetic material between the engineered organism and the organism naturally in the environment. And so what we can do is essentially what we call recode the genome, change its genetic code. And moreover, we are at a point where we are able to start thinking about total resynthesis of genomes. So these can be totally synthetic genomes that cannot interact with their natural counterparts. Lastly, we induce suicide switches. So once the bacteria pass through the animal or the human, they kill themselves. So for example, inside your gut, that environment doesn't have very much oxygen. The bacteria like to live in low oxygen. When they come through and are exposed to oxygen, they die. All right, so let me end with the vision that there will be a pill, much as there is a probiotic now, but instead this would have a customizable engineered bacteria, could be just for you, could be for targeted to certain diseases, could be for beneficiary reasons, and this is what you will take in the future. So I'll leave you with that. <laughs> I'm supposed to introduce the next speaker, uh, and um, our next speaker is, speaker is Bapu Jenna from, I believe you're from Mass MGH, is that right? Or Part time, yeah. Harvard Medical School. <laughs> so I'm going to go slideless. Is my mic working okay? Sounds good. Okay. All right. Um, so my wife and I were supposed to go see a movie this weekend, date night. I think I'm going to try to convince her to see your movie instead. It looks like it might be more interesting. Uh, so I'm an economist and a physician, and I spend most of my time in healthcare policy here at HMS, and I also work at National Hospital as a hospitalist. What that means is that I take care of inpatients about six weeks uh, out of the year, and it's a tremendous source for ideas that, I, that I'll talk to you about in a few minutes in my research. Uh, so what, what is healthcare economics? So before I answer that question, let me ask you just to think Imagine the world 50 years ago. I'm just scanning the audience, and it looks like 80% of you are below the age of 50. But just imagine the world 50 years ago. What did it look like? So the types of computers that we have now, we didn't have then. The ability for two human beings sitting on opposite ends of the world to be able to pick up a handheld device and talk to each other in real time, that didn't exist like it does today. The information that we have at our fingertips through the internet didn't exist. The iPhone didn't exist. Right? And see, these are all innovations that have changed our life. But what is more important from a societal perspective than, than those innovations, even in aggregate? So there's a difference now compared to 1950, and that is human beings, at least in this country, live about 10 more years on average than they used to. So what does 10 years of life mean? It means that it's time to spend with your friends, your family, your loved ones, to eat food including at the HMS cafeteria to drink water by uh, Santogo. Well, I'm not a sponsor, but uh, <laughs> 10 years of life is immensely valuable to society. Just imagine all the things that you want to do that you could do if you had that at a time. And so at its core, the reason I tell you this is at its core, health economics is really about understanding how market forces and, and economic forces affect the ability of individuals to live the lives that they want to lead. That is what health economics is all about. We hear a lot of studies about the American Affordable Care Act, about insurance expansions. All of these things implicitly are focused on, on understanding that one issue better. And then also to understand how do we generate the technologies that uh, Peter and Pam were talking about, and how do we sustain them in the future? That is what health economics is about. Now, what do I do? That was a very lofty description of health economics. I don't, it's broader than what I do. I study a range of questions. I look at questions like uh, what happens to politicians who are elected? Do they die prematurely because the stress of politics kills? That's the flavor of questions that I answer. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some other questions that we're looking at now. But one of the general themes of my research is to really try to understand what works and what doesn't work uh, in healthcare and to try to think creatively about how can we use 
new data sets, big data sets, experimental techniques that mirror uh, what Peter and Bam just talked about but are difficult to conduct unless you actually have a randomized controlled trial. How do we do that in healthcare to figure out what works and, and doesn't work? So I'll give you two examples, and if I have time, I'll give you a third. Uh, but before that, uh, there are about 35,000 people watching this right now, and so I'm actually going to ask for local audience participation. Please raise your hands, because if you don't raise your hands, I will look bad in front of 35,000 people, okay? And if I tell a joke, please laugh. No, you don't, you don't have to laugh. I'll try. Uh, all right, so how, raise your hand if any, any of you have had a loved one, a family member, or known anybody who has suffered a, a serious cardiac event, be it cardiac arrest, heart attack, serious heart failure. Raise your hands. So most of the audience, in fact, has, has raised their hands. The reason I ask is because if you think about how medical technology has changed in the last 30 years, cardiac disease is one of those areas where we have made tremendous improvements uh, in, in, in uh, healthcare treatments, ranging from beta blockers to statins to more invasive interventions like PCI, which stands for percutaneous coronary intervention. It's stenting of the blood vessels that supply uh, the heart. So those types of, uh, of innovations have really changed the landscape of cardiac disease, both in the U.S. and globally, to the extent that in some parts of the United States and in some healthcare systems, it's actually the case that cancer mortality is exceeding heart disease mortality, which has not been the case for many, many years uh, in, in the United States. And nonetheless, cardiology and cardiac care is plagued by one of these issues that I'm sure you've heard about, which is overuse. The idea that there are some patients who are treated but with interventions that are sometimes invasive and aggressive that they certainly didn't need and in some cases might have caused harm, and this is despite the fact this is among the fields in medicine where there is the most robust evidence base across all fields. There are tons of randomized controlled trials in cardiology that recruit thousands of patients and give us a better understanding of what works and what doesn't work on average. And yet, nonetheless, there is still this issue of figuring out in the real world setting what works and what doesn't work. And that's what I do. I try to understand those questions using the tools of, of economics. And, and I'll give you an example. So suppose you want to understand whether more invasive care, and I realize this is a, a general audience, a mixed audience, and sometimes for me, mixed means microeconomists and macroeconomists. This is a little bit different. But so I, I'll keep my comments very general. But what happens when you deliver invasive or aggressive cardiac care in the real world settings? Are patients better off or patients worse off on average because of that? How would you study that question? So you, let's say you had access to huge data, large amounts of data for Medicare or from a large insurer like Blue Cross Blue Shield or from a state Medicaid agency, and you wanted to understand whether aggressive care leads to better cardiac outcomes. Now, the reason that's a really difficult question to study is because if you just look at the data, what you're going to see is that patients who, have, who are sicker, who require intensive care, aggressive care, they're going to have worse outcomes, right? That's why they got that care in the first place. It's because they're sicker. And so what that means is that you can't just look at observational data and say that, well, aggressive care, invasive care, that actually leads to worse outcomes. It's not causally identified, meaning it's not a cause and effect relationship because there's something that you're missing about these patients that led them to get the care in the first place. So how would you solve that problem? That's what I try to do. In economics, we have these tools. We call them natural experiments. The idea behind a natural experiment is much like what we heard uh, just a few minutes ago, is to try to find experiments that occur in nature and that effectively randomize patients to one type of intervention versus another. So it allows us to understand in a real-world setting what is very difficult to do unless you do a randomized controlled trial or a controlled lab experiment. So for example, if you are hospitalized at, I work at MGH, so I'm going to pick on the Brigham. If you're hospitalized at Brigham and Women's Hospital in the first week of May, you're likely to get a particular cardiologist on call. If you're hospitalized the second week of May, you're going to get a different interventional cardiologist on, cardiologist on call. If you're hospitalized the third week, a different doctor. No one picks what week they want to have a cardiac arrest or a heart attack. And so if they happen to come at a certain time, they are effectively randomized to a different cardiologist, a potentially different type of care. And so you can now imagine how using the week that someone is hospitalized in the hospital aside from the first week of July, which is, is a dangerous time to be hospitalized in, in any teaching hospital. But aside from that, the week that someone is hospitalized, 
it tells you something about how that patient was effectively randomized to potentially different types of care. So that's some work that we are actually trying to do, and, and hopefully I can share some outcomes with you later. But let me give you a different example. How many of you are scientists? Raise your hand. OK, and how many of you have traveled to a major scientific meeting in the last year? OK, how many have used government funds to do that? No, don't answer that question. <laughs> don't, answer, don't answer that. OK, so most of you raise your hand. Most of you are scientists. Most of you traveled to a scientific meeting in the last year. The reason I ask is because this is one of those times when cardiologists, not just cardiologists, all sorts of doctors, but I'm going to focus on cardiologists, it's a time in the year where a set of doctors who normally practice at a teaching hospital would, in probability, go to these meetings. All right? And so what happens is, suppose you're a patient and you have a cardiac arrest during the second week of November or the first week of March, and you happen to have it during the dates of one of these national cardiology conferences, and you're hospitalized during that period. How does the type of care that you receive differ from an otherwise identical patient who happened to have a cardiac arrest four days earlier or four days later. So you can all of, all of a sudden see how now we have this unique natural experiment whereby somebody had an adverse cardiac event that happened to happen at a period of time where certain cardiologists were not in the hospital, but they were at a, a national cardiology conference. And we've actually studied this issue. We've looked at this in Medicare. And what we found in looking at three conditions, cardiac arrest, very high-risk heart failure, and high-risk heart attacks, is that patients actually do better when they're hospitalized during the dates of these meetings. So I'll reiterate that final point, <laughs> OK? So patients actually do better if they're hospitalized during the dates of these national cardiology conferences. And it's a striking, it's a striking finding. And to be honest, when we first set out to look at this, we were expecting the opposite. But nonetheless, we found what we found. And the numbers are large. So I'll give you some numbers. So the mortality for someone with cardiac arrest, cardiac arrest is when your heart stops pumping blood. It's a bad thing, OK? Um, it's almost as bad as having Comcast cable. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a bad thing, OK? Mortality at 30 days is about 70%. If you happen to be hospitalized with cardiac arrest on the date of a, a national cardiology conference, your mortality is 60%. That's a 10 percentage points difference. That is huge that is larger in magnitude than most other interventions that we've seen in the entire field of cardiology in the last 30 years. So it tells you something about the potential practice style impacts here, not specific interventions that are done. All right? Now, the first thing you have to ask is, well, you know, Bapu, maybe these patients are different. And they certainly could be. And if you're a critical person, maybe if you're a journal reviewer, for example, a critical person, you would say, these patients are clearly different. And I would respond by saying, how could they be? You don't choose when your heart stops. Your heart just stops, right? And on top of that, you don't have to take that argument for face, to be face valid. You can actually just look at the data. So look at the data and see whether the characteristics of patients who were hospitalized during the dates of a national cardiology conference are the same as during the other periods in the surrounding weeks. And what you find when you look at the data is that across almost 20 different characteristics, they are virtually identical. And what that means is that this is a, a really unique but true natural experiment. These patients were effectively randomized to receiving care in these two different periods. All right. Now, you could push further and say, well, you've just shown me that on these 20 different characteristics that these patients are identical. But maybe there's something that you're not missing. Maybe there's something that you're missing. Maybe there's something that's unobserved about the patients who are hospitalized during this period, uh, during the dates of these meetings. Well, you know, economists take this kind of criticism very seriously. And the way they try to approach it is, is, is to say, OK, well, let's, let's be more rigorous. How can we show this in a, in a causal way? So what you can do, for example, is posit that if it were the case that there's some unobserved characters, characters of these patients, well, we would expect that mortality from hip fracture and mortality from GI bleeding or mortality from, uh, let's say, stroke would be higher during the dates of these meetings as well. Turns out that they're not. So I, I, know this is, I guess it's called a negative control in, 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 in lab science. But the basic idea is this is just one way to push the data further to try to move beyond what's just an association to what may be a cause and effect relationship. So what's going on here? So what we find, and this is the clincher, is that rates of stenting fall by about a third during this period rates of this relatively aggressive intervention fall by about a third. 
And what that does suggest then is that there could be this group of patients that at the margin are actually being harmed by somewhat intensive care during the non-meeting periods. Now, how could that actually play out? How could that actually be the case? Well, let me give you a thought example. It's the following. Imagine that you were a cardiologist and you're a good cardiologist and you had 100 patients that you could choose to receive a procedure, let's say stenting in a year. I would bet that most cardiologists, and I think most of you would agree, that most cardiologists would do a really good job of figuring out who are the 100 of those patients who would be suitable for that procedure for whom the benefits would outweigh the risks. But in reality, that constraint doesn't exist. We can do 101 stents, we can do 102 stents, we can do 250 stents. And so what happens is that in the real world, in real world settings, we start moving from this black and white world to a world in which medicine is practiced in the gray, where there are patients who may or may not benefit from a procedure. And so this is all that say the following, is that, again, what I'm interested in learning and what I think healthcare economics as a field is trying to do is understand what works and what doesn't work in healthcare. And this is just one example of how you use large data and creative techniques to try to understand what types of care, what patterns of care may lead to, to better or worse outcomes. So I have a few minutes left. I want to switch gear to give you, an example, uh, give you another example of the type of work I do. How many of you have heard of the new drugs to treat hepatitis C? Raise your hand. OK. Are these cheap or expensive? Expensive. They're cheap. No, no. They're expensive. They're extraordinarily expensive. And they've gotten a lot of attention for that, uh, both insurers and um, state uh, Medicaid agencies are really feeling uh, the pinch, the budget pinch, because of the price of these drugs. Now, as I said, what, what do I want to do? I want to understand what works and what doesn't work in healthcare. And in order to do that, you have to be able to understand what are the societal impacts that different drugs and different devices and other interventions have on society. So hepatitis C is actually a really unique example, and you'll see why it generalizes in a second. The number one cause for liver transplant in the United States is hepatitis C cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is end-stage liver disease. It can reach the problem of confusion, infections, and ultimately uh, mortality. It's a really high-risk uh, mortality condition. And hepatitis C is the number one reason for transplant in the United States uh, for livers. Now, what will these new drugs do in the future? So these drugs have been heralded as cures for hepatitis C, and I think most clinicians and, and, and scientists would agree that these really are representing a, they do represent a medical breakthrough Despite their, despite their high costs, but what is going to be the impact of these drugs in the future? So one is, we hope that they will cure the population to a large extent of hepatitis C. And that's kind of an obvious impact of this, these drugs on society. But what else are they going to do? All of the patients who would have required liver transplants if they had not been cured of hepatitis C are no longer going to require liver transplants. Now, what does that mean for society? It doesn't just mean that we are now forestalling liver transplants and saving money from that. That's great, but that's not what's most important. What's most important is that by sparing these livers from being transplanted into patients with hepatitis C cirrhosis, those livers can actually now go into other patients. Patients who have liver disease from alcohol, patients who have liver disease from obesity, and other forms of, of liver disease. So the basic idea here is that there is this unique linkage that is created when there is a fixed constraint. In this case, the constraint is transplantable organs. By alleviating one disease, you free up those resources to actually make the lives of other people better off. And this is not just, general, this is not just an issue that's specific to hepatitis C. Think about drugs to treat uh, diabetes, for instance. If you cure diabetes, you no longer have a demand for kidney transplants among these patients, and those kidneys can now be transplanted into patients who have end-stage kidney disease and are on, di on dialysis from hypertension or from other forms of, of kidney disease. So that, that's the kind of work that I do, and I hope I've tried to convince you in the last few minutes that we're trying to use big data, methods of economics to try to understand better what works and what doesn't work in healthcare. And I, I think we'll move to the Q&A section, but before, before we do that, I'll just say that there's two things that really make the work that I do possible. The first is the clinical exposure that I get. It means a lot to be able to care for patients and understand the issues that affect them. And two is that I have a tremendous group of colleagues that support me. My RA, Andrew Olinsky, is actually here today. Nothing would be possible without him. So thank you.
Okay, um, we're looking forward to entertaining questions on any of uh, these three talks. Pam and I were uh, sitting in back thinking the deep connection between medicine and research is proven by the fact that when scientists go uh, off to national conferences, uh, the research goes much better uh, as far as we can ascertain. <laughs> Way our, more productive when we're labs. gone. <laughs> uh, so any questions from the audience? Anyone? Yeah, so I was wondering, um, you looked at the patient characteristics. Have you also looked at characteristics of the cardiologists who are going to the meetings? <laughs> We, we actually have, oh yes, yeah. so the question was, have you looked at the, so you've looked at the patients, I'll repeat the question just to make it easier, and um, have you looked at the characteristics of the cardiologists? So we actually, we actually have looked at, the nice thing about billing data is that a doctor has to bill for his or her service, and so we know quite precisely who is providing care and when they are providing care, and we've linked that to other data on physicians in terms of their characteristics. So the average age of the doctors is about the same, about 53 years old, Similarly likely to be uh, male versus female. The key difference is that the doctors who attend these meetings tend to perform on average 30% more uh, of these stenting procedures per year, and they have about two times as many NIH grants and publications. And <laughs> so they're, they're different types of doctors, let's say that. Uh. I, I feel bad because I probably fall into that category. <laughs> Other questions? Well, that was very interesting. But with all the new things we know, what's going to happen about clinical trials? Because people differ. You might say we randomly select people, but when we know about their genes and all that, what are we going to do about clinical trials? Well, I'm sure there's going to be more than one answer. Let me give one answer to the question. So in cancer, in, in, in trials for cancer, as I think uh, many in the audience are aware, the current standard is to try to what's called stratify the patient population, which is to use a genetic or other diagnostic criteria in order to guess which patients are going to benefit the most. Uh, it turns out that, and so therefore in that setting, uh, phase clinical trials still remain the gold standard for approval of any new drug. Uh, it turns out, though, that, uh, that uh, particularly in oncology, has been revolutionized by a, a program that allows drugs to get into marketing, into patients much earlier than they otherwise would have, the so-called accelerated approval process. And so uh, that raises the interesting question whether you now collect a significant piece of the evidentiary basis for the use of, of, of oncology drugs after the drug has passed the normal barrier between pre- and post-marketing. And that's sometimes called phase four studies. So in fact, actually, um, there's a lot of innovation in clinical trial design, both to understand much more about what happens after a drug is approved and it gets into patients, and also to work out how to run clinical trials more efficiently um, and to maintain the same rigor. But, um, I mean, Peter makes a good, you don't need Peter makes a good point, but you're talking about drugs that are for a very select population as opposed to, um, say, vaccines, which everyone's going to be taking. And I think that is a challenge because there are many drugs that could be life-saving for the earth and including developing countries, yet how do we do the kinds of trials you need for things that are, are not there just to save people from dying? I don't have an answer so, to that. Maybe you do. I do, I do, I do want to say on this regard is, you know, insofar as anybody has an opportunity to, uh, to, to talk to your congressperson or senator, I think it's very, I mean, I think it's important for those of us here, but hopefully for many people uh, in the audience as well, to maintain a, a kind of evidentiary basis, which we heard about particularly in the last talk. There are currently a series of lawsuits going through, uh, through the court system, the federal court system, that were, were representatives of some drug companies are asserting a First Amendment right to market a drug in the absence of any scientific evidence that it's efficacious. And so I think there are threats to the, and this is a very serious matter, and I think there are, even as we're seeing more and more interest in getting trials be more efficient to get better evidence of what works, there are also threats within the system uh, to the entire regimen that we've had for the last 60 years. I think the one thing I'd add to that is that in the policy world, the big debate is around these surrogate endpoints, particularly in cancer. And the trade-off is really a speed safety trade-off. 
on one hand, you want to use overall survival in an oncology trial because that's ultimately what you want in the real world. But the problem is that it takes time for overall survival endpoints to be achieved. And particularly as a standard of care gets better and better, the trials will have to be longer and longer to be able to demonstrate that. And so the real question is, how much can you get from using the surrogate endpoints to actually predict real world survival? Um, so my first question for Peter, uh, all this mathematical model you build upon from the Petri dish, how much do you envision it also works the same model like in vivo in the mirror model before you take it into clinical trial? Yeah, I don't think there's any expectation that, you know, studying, as there's really have two answers to that. There's no expectation that studying cells in a dish is going to tell you how cells work in a human. On the other hand, uh, it's clearly better to understand how basic biochemistry functions in a dish than do it right rather than do it wrong. The second thing is, um, and I didn't have time to talk about that at all today, is within both my group in particular, but within this larger therapeutics program, a very large amount of effort is also coming from the other direction. So as to actually look at and model clinical trial outcomes. And, um, and in many cases, actually, the results are extremely surprising. So for example, in the last uh, few months, we've come up with a very different hypothesis about how combination clinical trials work. In, uh, in oncology. So, so I don't think by any means the application of these tools is restricted to cells in a dish. And, and, and I think you would, what you would like to see, and this is the sense in which it's much more like engineering, um, you, know, you would like to see something that was effective in the face of partial knowledge. So the whole purpose of quantifying and modeling something is not, it's not the last detail after you've understood all the interesting thing. It's the things that allow you to make rational decisions in the face of incomplete information. OK, so uh, uh, my question is for Professor Salt and uh, Professor Seal. So uh, are there any new research results can be used out of the library? So that means no more people can get a benefit, no more patient. We, I guess I mean, we imagine. Um, for example, that um, if you could have a therapeutic or a diagnostic bacteria constitutively living in your gut, that it would always be there to monitor the health of your gut, as opposed to um, invasive techniques like endoscopy, which people use now. Um, and also, it could be an earlier detector of cancer or inflammation. Um, these are some of the things that we and others anticipate from this kind of technology. You know, the other thing I would, you know, add to what Pam said is, you know, there is a sense that a new discovery in the laboratory takes quite some time to make its way into clinical practice numbers like a decade or more. Uh, but it's also true uh, that we actually understand drugs in use today, both generic and branded drugs. We understand how they work remarkably poorly. In those cases, um, advances in the laboratory can actually have an impact in clinical care in, in timescales of months to years. So I don't think there's any, there's any sense that these are all infinitely distant promises. These, these, these will play out over different times. And, and certainly, the, I think there's a lot of uh, interest in the fact that those of us, um, as we age uh, and we start to get treated with more and more drugs, 80, 80 to 90 percent of them are going to be generic drugs. And those are, generic, those are drugs, for the most part, which have, have not been studied with any rigorous science uh, uh, since the time of their approval. So there's an enormous opportunity to improve the evidentiary basis, both at the economic end, and I think it's Pam saying in the diagnostic, and also at the actual treatment side for, for real patient benefit. The other component to this, of course, is, is investment. And um, in the kinds of things we're doing, there's actually a lot of interest in early investment from the private sector in this. And so there are even already startup companies in this space, even though we, it's hard to imagine how this could be implemented, as I said, because these are recombinant organisms. But there are people already making that, invest, that bet. You can shout it out, and I'll repeat it. Uh, so I have a question in regards to uh, bioengineered microbiome or a microbe that could be helpful in treating certain diseases. Uh, and that sounds more like personalized medication. Now, currently we were just talking more like about what? The personalized medication where you can change, you can uh, create a microbe to treat a specific disease in a, in a specific person. 
How does that translate to uh, government regulation in terms of how you regulate something like that? Currently, it takes quite uh, you know, some time and a lot of resources to bring a drug to the market or a generalized, me generalized medication. When it comes to personalized medication, how, how do you foresee regulation growing? Yeah, so the question, um, it's a great question, has to do uh, with reference to, to Pam's uh, discussion about engineered microorganisms, but it's a much more general one if you have a personalized medicine and that's really going to be used for one or a very small number of patients, how do the economics of its evaluation and approval play out? So first let me speak to um, the issue of personalized, what we're doing, whether or not that's personalized medicine. I think it can be, and I use that term. But I also think it can be generalizable because many of the kinds of uh, signals that we're looking for as either diagnostics or therapeutics are in fact generalizable. And in fact, the example I gave you was for a general signal of inflammation. So in that sense, these could be used in a, as a general kind of approach. But I think um, with regard to personalized medicine, and maybe you can speak to this also, I'm fascinated by these strategies of, of um, you know, individualized immunotherapies for cancer, which Again, how do you do clinical trials on that? But some of these are, are seem, at least you, you hear, that they're extremely successful, yet extremely expensive. And then it becomes sort of uh, therapies for the rich. And so you must have some perspective yeah, I mean, on this. So there's two issues. One is a regulatory issue, and then two is how do you produce these drugs? So from a regulatory standpoint, it's from safety and efficacy. If you're able to demonstrate this proof of concept that, let's say, individualized immune therapies for cancer works in a sample of 100 patients, even though they're each getting 100 different therapies, I think that would be fine to, to lead to ultimate adoption of the drug. But the pricing is very challenging because, for the most part, drug companies are able to recoup their investments because they're able to sell drugs to a lot of patients. Whereas in this case, you can imagine it's just one patient who has a presumably a very high willingness to pay because the drug specificity is high, but it also means that you have to do that investment for that one patient. And so to the extent that there are these large fixed costs, you can imagine that the prices that, that would kind of follow from personalized medicine could be extraordinarily high. One other quick uh, point that I just want to make on that is you might actually also ask for, in, in the contemporary vein, uh, you know, what, what is actually uh, the sort of opportunity cost of developing a new drug. It varies a bit between indication, but numbers like a billion dollars are tossed around. If you actually look at that, about 80, over 80 percent of the total cost is the cost of past failure. So, so many drugs fail in phase clinical trial. What's interesting about that is that we take the process of failure of drugs and we don't study it at all. So in engineering, as you're well aware, there's a concept of root cause analysis. You know, Boeing has a problem with its battery packs. It does a root cause analysis. Uh, works out how to fix it, and planes are up in the air a couple of weeks later. If that was drug discovery, the 787s would have been lined up on the edge of the Puget Sound and then plowed out into the ocean, and then we would have started with the 797, which would have cost a heck of a lot more. So it is interesting. It is interesting for an industry which is, you know, has a significant problem calculating ROI that we have no established discipline of understanding from success and failure. And uh, it's, it's really an extraordinary gap. And it's one of, I think, many gaps where engineering and sort of economics does somehow, through all these years, is not being brought to bear to reduce the opportunity cost of developing a new drug. That would be at least one way. And you wouldn't have to make that big an improvement. Go to 50% failure, cost would drop by half. As a follow-up to that, um, do you think that in cases of something that's more precision-based that can be generalized for something like salmonella c compared to an immunotherapy that's you create a vaccine from autologous tumors, for example, for a patient, um, wouldn't something like an, a, a, pers a personalized medicine be able to overcome some of the off-target side effects that you might see from something more generalized? And so from an economic standpoint, would that even though it is more expensive to have it personalized, could that overcome the additional cost of off-target side effects? So let me just speak to that for one second. Um, that, uh, speaking to the economics, I'll let these people do that, but one thing about engineering biology that we hope to be able to do, um, the more we do it, the better we get at it, and in principle, it can be cheaper, um, cheaper and faster. And so in some future time, 
we might be able to engineer biology sufficiently fast and cheaply to make it make personalized medicine more of a reality. Um, in the time for the time being, I don't think I mean, you guys can speak to that. Yeah. So I think that a general point is we we focus too much on cost. What I would think about is what what is the value of a drug that has fewer side effects to society to the individual patient. So one is that their quality of life is better. But two is that it allows patients to be treated who otherwise wouldn't be treated. And that expansion of the eligible patient population is probably tremendously valuable, aside from the cost of treating those additional patients. I think we're going to entertain one final brief question, and then we have to wrap up this session. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, was there, any, was there anyone else? You put I asked the okay. No, no, it's fine. You, you get the last word. Okay. So my question is, of the 10-year life expansion we've gotten in the last 50 years, how much of it did we get through public health <laughs> initiatives, and how much of it do we get from this fancy medicine or sports? So the question is, yeah, so the question is the great one, which is how much is, is sewage treatment, and how much is fancy medicine and antibiotics? So first let me answer the meaning of life. No, uh, it's about 50-50. That's what most people think. So... There's a lot that's come from improved sanitation, and there's a lot that's come from things like antibiotics. And how much the money is spent? How much is that 50 or uh, <laughs> that, that, uh, I'm not the money man. I don't know. <laughs> Safer cars. I think we all know from the cars. American <laughs> Society of Civil Engineers that we are 40 years behind in investment for our sewage system. So thank you all very much uh, uh, for great discussion. There's so many things that go into that, like roads and cars. Yeah. And, yeah. I think I was just